Hello YouTube, Dave here again. Uh, this is the start of a new series of videos that I'm doing. Uh, I'm doing them for the uh, the one year anniversary of 5th uh, edition Dungeons & Dragons. It's been out for about a year now, but Dungeons & Dragons as a whole has actually been around for a little over 40 years now. Uh, following 5th edition on social media, I've seen an influx of people who are new to this hobby. So this is the first time that they've, you know, picked up a role-playing book and they're really excited about, you know, the new opportunities and the, the fun that awaits them. Um, but for those members, uh, you know, uh, basically what I wanted to do was kind of go over some of the history of the Dungeons and Dragons game, uh, let them know a little bit of the background and some of the different, uh, you know, additions that have come out just to give them sort of an overall view of, of what the game is now and how it got to where it is now. So the different things that have happened over the course of the last 40 years, because it is an amazing hobby with an amazing history and uh, quite a bit of diversity in the additions. So what I wanted to do was go over those. Uh, so this will be a retrospective basically on, uh, on Dungeons and Dragons. All right, our story begins in the late 1960s with tabletop miniature war games. So these were games that were played on uh, a large tabletop surface with miniatures and measuring tapes and dice. Um, most of these games recreated historic battles from like the World Wars or some medieval type battles. Uh, tabletop war gamers had quite a committed following and among these fans was a man by the name of Gary Gygax. Uh, Gary actually founded a group called the International Federation of Wargaming in 1967 in order to exchange ideas on new rules and concepts for these tabletop miniatures games. <clears throat> As time went on, he became more and more interested in the medieval warfare uh, and created the Castle and Crusade Society in 1970. Uh, in that, he created a fictional world known simply as the Great Kingdom, and members of the society were assigned their own regions within the kingdom to make it their own. Uh, one of these men went by the name of Dave Arneson, and his region basically became known as Blackmore. And the significance of that will kind of uh, be explained here in a little bit. In 1971, uh, Gary Gygax and Jeff Perrin released their own miniatures uh, game called Chainmail. And what Chainmail was, uh, it was a one of these tabletop miniature war games that was medieval focused, but it also introduced fantasy elements like uh, wizards, dragons, you know, heroes and things of that nature. Um, now, after this had come out, Dave Arneson actually used the Chainmail rules to create a campaign with heroes entering dungeons to slay monsters and acquire dragons in his Blackmoor setting. Uh, in 1973, uh, Gygax, Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson began work on a new type of game, focusing not on large armies, but on you know small bands of heroes, um, basically going into to explore dungeons, fight monsters, and again, acquire treasure. And the final result of this would be known as Dungeons and Dragons. All right, so this is where it all began. This is the original Dungeons and Dragons, also referred to as Zero E for Zero Edition, or OD&D for Original Dungeons and Dragons. This is the very original set that had come out in 1974. Uh, it was released as a box set with these three booklets inside. Um, and the three booklets are Men and Magic, which has everything you need for making your characters. Uh, Monsters and Treasures, which gives the Game Master or the Referee as it's referred to. Uh, the opportunity to basically stock dungeons with monsters, provide them with magic items for overcoming those challenges. And then you have the Underworld and Wilderness Adventures, which is kind of like uh, rules for creating campaigns and, and overarching stories, I guess. The, uh, the game still draws pretty heavily on the chainmail rule system, so it's one of those things that, you know, the, the chainmail combat system is still pretty much what they used for this version here. Uh, my understanding is that you kind of need this uh, version of this to get the, the full rules. It has, like, the combat charts for, you know, attacks versus armor and stuff like that. Um, I think there are some reference sheets. I do have them. I just don't have them handy, and they may include some of that information, but it's still very heavily connected to the, uh, the chainmail tabletop miniatures game. Uh, as far as being able to create characters, uh, the list of characters is, or classes is pretty limited. There's only three in the book. There's the fighting men, magic user, and cleric. Uh, as far as races go, it has your four standard races. Uh, it has your humans, which are simply referred to as men. 
uh, elves, dwarves, and halflings, which at one point, at least, get referred to as hobbits. Um, when you go to create your characters, uh, the way that it works is humans are unrestricted. Humans can be any class, and they can progress through the entire uh, level progression of each class. Um, the, and the amount of levels in the classes kind of varies. So some of them have like 9, 11, or you know, somewhere kind of in between that. Uh, dwarves were limited to the fighting men class, so they could not be magic users, and only humans or, or men could be clerics. Um, dwarves being limited to the fighting man class, uh, they were also limited to 6th level. Uh, I think it's about a 9 level progression in this book, so it's not that bad when you, you look at how many levels were actually available, but 6th level was the highest they can get. Their basic advantages was that they could save against like spells as a character 4 levels higher. So a 6th level dwarf fighter, or fighting man, would save against a spell or magical effect as if he was a 10th level character, which is pretty good. Um, they also were the only race that could make full use of the plus three Warhammer, which is an item that is found in the Monsters and Treasure book. Uh, what the plus three Warhammer is, um, if a dwarf uses it, the, th the, the Warhammers in the game could be thrown. There were little blurbs about throwing them. A dwarf could throw the hammer twice as far as a regular, like a um, human or an elf or any other class. Um, in addition, the dwarf throwing the uh, the Warhammer gets a full plus three bonus to the, uh, the ranged attack, which other classes would only be able to get like plus one or plus two, or the races, I, sh I should say. And the magical warhammer will actually return to a dwarf's hand after he throws it, so that's a unique advantage of being the dwarf. Uh, the halflings, not so great in this uh, early version of the game. They're limited to the fighting man class, at least in this book, and they can only reach fourth level. The only thing that they kind of have going for them is they also get the save bonus, where they save as someone four levels higher. Uh, elves are probably one of the more interesting races in this book because they can actually be either fighting men or magic users and they have the option to flip back and forth between the two. At the start of an adventure, not a game session, uh, but adventure, the characters or the elf character can choose whether he wants to be a fighting man or a magic user. As a fighting man, he can only go up to about fourth level, but as a magic user, he can reach up to eighth level, uh, which is one of those unique things. So at the start of the adventure, they decide, you know, if this seems like a situation that's going to warrant them being a fighter type, or if they would be more useful as a magic user. Uh, they can't switch on the fly, however, so it's not like they can go into one encounter as a magic user and then change into a fighting man for the next one. You are locked into your decision until the end of the adventure. So again, I don't, it's not the game session, it's the actual adventure. So if you're doing a dungeon crawl, you are whatever class you chose to be at the beginning until you're done that dungeon. So that's it for the first three books. Now, over the course of the next couple of years, they did release some more supplements. Uh, a total of four were released. The first one that was released was the Greyhawk setting. So this is the, um, technically it's the first published campaign setting for Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, in this book here, they actually introduce the thief class. So it expands the, uh, the, the list. So instead of just having the fighting man, uh, magic user and cleric, you now have a thief, which I believe uh, the halflings were uh, better able to uh, progress in, in the thief class. Also after that, the second supplement was Dave Arneson's Blackmore. Now this book is significant for a couple of reasons. Number one, this is the only one of the original D&D lineup that does not have Gary Gygax's name on it. His name is on every other supplement that was released, but this book is wholly Dave Arneson's. And this is the Blackmore setting which he created using the chainmail rules back when he was part of the Crus or Castle and Crusade Society back in the 19, like early 1970s, you know, before this came out. Uh, Blackmoor, uh, the use of the chainmail rules in the Blackmoor setting is one of the things that helped create Dungeons & Dragons in the first place, so this is pretty significant. It also introduces two more classes, so you introduce in this one the Monk and the Assassin. So those are classes introduced in this. Supplement 3 was Eldritch Wizardry. And I'm not going to focus on the cover for too long, uh, just because I don't want to have any issues with... Uh, 
with ratings or anything like that. Um, but with Eldritch Wizardry, they introduce a few new things. Uh, there's some new monsters, there's some new spells. Um, there's also the introduction of psionics in the psionic combat system in this book. And it also introduces the druid class. So you get psionics and the druid in this book. The fourth and final supplement for original Dungeons and Dragons uh, was entitled uh, Gods, Demigods, and Heroes. Now, I don't have that book. That's the only one of the uh, original D&D lineup that I don't own. Um, now, basically what the, uh, what the supplement included was pantheons, information on pantheons, stats for the gods, and uh, there may have been some more stuff than that. I, I don't really know because, again, I don't have it. Uh, but from my understanding from people who have played these original versions, uh, the overall consensus seems to be that that was kind of the weakest supplement of them all. And the, you know, the, the friend that I got these from all had all these, never bothered with the last one because he just wasn't interested in it. So I can't really say too much about it. There are probably people out there who love it. I don't own it myself, so I can't really say anything. Anyway, so that's the original Dungeons and Dragons game. So this version of D&D ran from 1974 until 1977. In 1977, TSR, the company that created Dungeons and Dragons, released the basic set, the Dungeons and Dragons basic set. So this was the first in a series that basically became known as, well, basic Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, basic D&D is the only version of the game I don't actually own, so I can't really talk about it. I'm not going to do a review or a video on something that I don't actually have the ability to read on my own and have physically in my hands. So I'm not going to talk about Basic Dungeons and Dragons, but if you are interested in it, uh, a fellow YouTuber by the name of uh, Capt Courageous, and I hope I'm saying that right, uh, he did an excellent review of that entire product line. And I'm going to include the uh, the link below uh, in the description for that video. I definitely recommend checking it out. It's a great review. He also did a review of the D&D Cy Rule Cyclopedia, which came out, which is kind of a um, compilation of the basic D&D product line. Uh, but anyway, as for myself in this channel, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to keep going and talk about the different versions of the D&D product line. And again, I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you check out the next one because in the next video, Dungeons and Dragons is going to get advanced. Again, thank you very much for watching YouTube and I hope to see you next time.